Uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, I appreciate that, and uh, and thank you, Brian, uh, uh, for putting this uh, this entire symposium together. Uh, I, I'm very privileged to be one of the presenters and and one of the organizers for the symposium. I'd like to talk a little bit today about the evolution of commercial space and its integration with U.S. military space. And what I have to say, I think, will fit in well with what Ken Davidian had just said and with some of the points that uh, Pete just made in his introduction. Uh, from the beginning of the space age, uh, the Air Force uh, procured space hardware, that is, launch vehicles and satellites or spacecraft, through contracts with industrial providers, something different from the Army and the Arsenal system. But gradually, uh, the Air Force augmented that model with contracts for commercial services. Uh, and this, in a way, reshaped the definition of commercial space, at least from a military perspective. Uh, since each presenter has been asked to define commercial space, uh, I'll begin with that. And then I'll discuss very briefly how evolving commercial space can be observed as becoming more integrated with U.S. military space across five mission sets over about seven decades. Next slide, please. Uh, I came up with uh, a rather cumbersome definition, I think, of commercial space. But uh, I'm going to say th that for my purposes, based on this study, it's the production, operation, or provision of space-based systems or services for which all or a substantial portion of capital investments and resulting profits derive from increasingly broad, diversified market sources, which could include both government and non-government consumers. Uh, this definition I've tried to depict here in this slide, it incorporates an evolutionary perspective where private industry's technological capabilities respond to or push legislation, public policy, and consumer demand for space-related goods and services in an increasingly dynamic marketplace, one that includes both public and private customers. And then belatedly, I thought about academia. <laughs> and so I plugged academia right into the middle of that triad. At the heart of it uh, is this academic system that provides scientific, technological, engineering, and mathematical education for all participants and augments research capabilities existing in the other portions uh, that are depicted in the lower left and right uh, corners, as well as uh, government agency. Next slide, please. When it comes to space launch, and this is the first of our several areas uh, or, or mission sets that we can look at here where this evolution has occurred, uh, the U.S. Air Force initially contracted with industry, uh, Martin, uh, uh, Douglas, and, and Convair, for rockets that originated as ballistic missiles and that procurement model was based historically on what the Air Force had done to procure aircraft. Essentially, uh, that model continued until 1983 and the beginning of the space shuttle era, when DOD and NASA payloads were uh, directed to be launched uh, on shuttle missions. Uh, then, at that point, President Reagan directed the uh, commercialization of expendable launch vehicles uh, for other kinds of launches. And uh, the passage of the Commercial Space Launch Act in 1984 reinforced Reagan's uh, presidential directive. Obviously, the, uh, the space shuttle uh, Challenger disaster in January of 1986 drove most uh, non-NASA payload launches back to expendable boosters and, uh, and resulted in large measure in the National Space Policy Directive of February 1988 it stipulated that government agencies should procure launch services from commercial companies. Over time, however, demand for launch vehicles dwindled to the point at the beginning of the 21st century where only the United Launch Alliance, consisting of, of, of Boeing uh, and Lockheed Martin, remained uh, in partnership as, as a sole provider. Uh, and so in the third decade of the 21st century, uh, congressional pressure on DOD uh, uh, sought to revitalize commercial launch competition for military launch services at least 
And that became possible with the emergence of SpaceX a Falcon 9, a partially reusable booster that reduced launch costs um, and uh, also uh, competition increased because of the market for smaller launchers uh, and numerous companies competing there as low Earth orbit became a more popular uh, orbital regime along with smaller satellites in that regime. DOD also shifted during this time from a policy of separate contracts for the procurement of the launch vehicle and for launch services. Uh, and that tended to be, in some cases, the United Launch Alliance uh, uh, providing launch services uh, for non-United Launch Alliance launchers. That, that created a, a bit of, uh, of legal competition in the courts. And, uh, and so it has shifted now so that uh, DOD is asking uh, uh, in contracts for the entire launch service package, which includes the vehicle uh, and the services to launch it. Next slide, please. When satellite communications emerged in the 1960s, the Air Force contracted with American industry for development and delivery of satellites like the initial uh, discus satellites that you see on the left of the slide, uh, made by Philco. Uh, competitive selection of, of industrial contractors for specific kinds of dedicated military communication satellites has continued to the present day. By the first Gulf War in 1991, however, military demand for satellite communications had already far surpassed DOD dedicated satellite capabilities. So procuring leased bandwidth from commercial providers became essential and it has expanded ever since that Gulf War, ultimately leading the U.S. Space Force recently to being assigned management for arranging all DOD commercial SATCOM services. An integrated combination of dedicated military and commercial SATCOM services with evolving technology of software-defined flexibility and reprogramming and beam reconfiguration for satellites on orbit has become vital for what the Space Force now calls fighting SATCOM resilience. And at present, the commercial space internet providers, uh, one of them uh, being SpaceX Starlink satellites that are going up about 60 at a time. Uh, these are prospective providers for much needed services in the Arctic region where global warming is creating all kinds of opportunities for competition. And uh, so we'll see where that goes. Next slide, please. Okay. The next area uh, or, or uh, segment, uh, mission segment that uh, we're, we're, where we've seen this kind of evolution is space-based remote sensing. Uh, this also developed during the late 1950s into the early 1960s with corporations contracting for the delivery of military photo reconnaissance and meteorological satellites, many of them classified uh, uh, up until uh, about the late 1990s. Uh, when ERTS, which is more familiar known as Landsat, the first civil uh, remote sensing system emerged a decade later in the 70s, bureaucratically imposed restrictions on camera resolution left civil imagery inferior to the corona reconnaissance follow-ons. Private sector ownership of Landsat, however, came with the Land Remote Sensing Commercialization Act in 1984. The Land Remote Sensing Act of October 1992 finally authorized private, high-resolution space remote sensing systems, with Worldview Imaging becoming the first licensed U.S. company in January of 1993. And it wasn't very long after that that commercial high-resolution hyperspectral, particularly hyperspectral imaging, became especially important for military users. It was, uh, I can remember distinctly, uh, comments about how hyperspectral imagery could allow the military to see things through uh, camouflage and uh, forest cover, things like that. By, 19, by 2020, commercialization of space remote sensing had expanded beyond imaging systems to analytics of the radio frequency spectrum. And now we have Hawkeye 360, for example, in the lower right corner there, you see their spacecraft, courting government subscribers for its corporate products and services. 
Next slide, please. In another mission set, for decades after October 1957 and the launch of Sputnik, the U.S. Space Surveillance Network provided detection, tracking, characterization, and cataloging of Earth-orbiting objects. The Air Force supplied NASA with selected data for distribution for non to non-DOD uh, satellite operators. As the number of tracked objects increased, however, the military took on space traffic management, warning operators of potentially destructive satellite conjunctions on orbit. In the early 21st century, however, with space becoming even more congested and contested, a commercial enterprise has emerged to deliver additional space situational awareness and collision avoidance data. In July 2018, the U.S. Military's Joint Space Operations Center at Vandenberg Air Force Base added a commercial presence to become the Combined Space Operations Center. Based on President Trump's June 2018 directive, DOD also initiated the transfer of space traffic management to the Commerce Department, and that process is ongoing as we speak. Next slide, please. And a final, final mission set that I had arranged to talk about was that although robotic on-orbit servicing to extend DOD satellite longevity had long been conceptualized since the 1980s, its practicality and profitable commercial potential only became fully demonstrable uh, in recent years. Orbital Express, a project that involved U.S. government, civil, and military organizations collaborating with private industry, successfully demonstrated robotic on-orbit servicing in 2007. This occurred when Boeing Astro Satellites Demonstration Manipular System, DMS, uh, developed by the Canadian firm MDA, autonomously captured the Ball Aerospace NextSat and transferred hydrazine propellant and a battery to extend NEXAT's lifetime. Then, just last year in 2020, I can remember sitting in briefings uh, where there were a lot of uniformed people being very excited to see the commercially developed and owned Mission Extension Vehicle 1, the robotic servicing spacecraft dock uh, in geosynchronous orbit with the aging Intelsat satellite, thereby extending the latter's functional lifetime. In this commercial triumph, the military space operators saw uh, tremendous possibilities for extending the longevity of some very expensive uh, DOD satellites in geosynchronous orbit. And that was where I, uh, I had anticipated ending this talk, but it just came to my attention that uh, with the reliance on commercial services, obviously from what I've just said, quickening within DOD, um, we have another opportunity, uh, a, if you will, a, a whole other mission set to look at. Space debris has been a problem for a long time, and the military has been very uh, involved in trying to deal with that. Well, on the 16th of March of this week, General D.T. Thomas, the Vice Chief of Space Operations, touted uh, a desirable mission set for, for uh, debris removal. He learned for the first time, had not heard of it before, that Astroscale, a Denver-based Japanese company, uh, is about to launch, in fact, on this Saturday, uh, March 20th, uh, its end-of-life services demonstration uh, uh, from Baikonur. And when he, he heard of this, he said, I'm going to have to Google that. He said, I'll pay by the ton if they can remove debris. The more we can depend on commercial space for routine activities like transportation and debris removal, the more we can focus on national security. So I guess that particular statement really sums up where we are today in this whole evolution of commercial space and its relationship uh, to integrating with military space. I thank you for your attention.